corporates on the uh, entrance that the list of seven o'clock people. Okay, yeah, you can put guests way down the building will be there, so yeah, we'll be there, so we. Yeah, just because there's not a spot left for somebody that doesn't mean they don't need to do this. You just want to make sure that we have people for sure turned up for yeah. different times. And, and the people that are in the freezer position there, um, that that's doesn't seem like it's a real taxing job, but it's um it's steady, 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 steady. So if you happen to come by there to see somebody been there for an hour and a half or so. It's asking if they need a break for a little while. It's not a lot of science, so you don't have to be a genius to do it. You're selling tickets and put money in the box. Uh, they don't come back. You know, sometimes I thought I need to work. Cindy, does that sign up sheet have a space for like email or phone number? Oh, wow. So, uh, but we'll also have a sign in sheet. Come in. <coughs> uh, and come in. Address and phone number, email, whatever they want to put there. That's important because for the sign up auction, uh, they may not be there. Or even for the uh, raffle, they may not be there and they have their name on a raffle ticket. Or they put their name on a sign auction item, you want to be able to contact them and get them, give them a chance to, uh, to claim that prize. And so I'll go through each of these right now. Uh, somebody comes in with an item, let's say you can go get a box of supplies, Carl. Okay? You're going to fill out a card like this. The instructions will be up there. If you enter one of those little clear, uh, Stands kind of when you have a oh no, I have to have a, <laughs> my projector right now, but it'll stand like this and you know, people will be able to see it. So if somebody asks some questions about submitting, you can just point to the sign. It's, instructions are clear. It says for each item donated, fill out the card with your name and brief description of item and submit the item and card to the front table. And the front table will decide whether it goes in the raffle. Or the hand was still on the side of auction. Typically, if it's a you know, it's a box, box of flies like that, it goes into the racket. Now, it may be that we have uh, Carlton may donate two boxes of flies. And so, we may put one of those boxes of flies in the gambler's draw. Or like Fred Haney, who's mm -hmm. the world class realistic fly tire. No one one of his little fly and some of auction items. Here. We'll have some reels and some rods, brand new stuff that will be in the gamut's draw and also in the sign of auction there. And we may have some reels and stuff in the gamut's draw, I mean, raffle. But typically, your raffle is small stuff, you know, because the tickets are what a dollar a piece. Gambling draws is going to be the bigger prizes, and the sign auction is going to be the big prizes that may not have the universal appeal, but they're going to be a high value, like that canoe. You know, you probably have 20 people interested in that canoe, but they're going to be big. They got one. It's a, great, it's a great idea. So anyway, that's the purpose of filling this out right here, is to let people know, front desk, what it is that you're doing. So they can know what bin to put it in. And also to recognize who donated it. And this should be filled out by the person who donated it. Because if they give you a box of flies, and you don't know what the supplies are, okay? And that defeats the purpose of giving them proper recognition they deserve. If they put in there, okay, these were flies tied by Lefty Cray. <laughs> it makes a big difference. 
You have to put those in the raffle. You probably can put those in the side auction, where hopefully Bill and I have to keep for it. Okay. Then we have, we'll have rules set up on sheets like this. Um, rules for the gambling scroll. We're going to have that at 1230. Now, what is a gambling scroll? Um, we have three decks of cards, playing cards. And we can, each card is $5. And what you do is you take your card that you got right here. Now I have cards with me, I'll use this card. And you tear it in half. You put half in the bin. Notice how I fold mine up, so it gives me a better chance to get it full. And I put it in that bin, that like bucket, and I keep the other half. So let's say somebody pulls the five of clubs, right? Okay. Uh, five of clubs, red deck. It's got to look at both sides. I pull the five of clubs, red deck. Somebody has this. Okay. They come up and match. Okay. Here are the prizes on the table. Pick the one you want. So the first person to pick is going to have his choice of all eyes on the table. And then let's say there are 12 items on the table. The 12 person who won't have a choice on there. So I promise you they'll all be good items. Okay. So we'll have the rules for the Amherst draw on the Amherst draw table. And these are $5 per card. The card sales begin at 10 a.m. Cindy and Christy and Rich. Okay, we've had this issue in the past where people have come up at eight o'clock in the morning and said, Can I get my can I buy cards from the gamblers drop? The answer is no. No, no, no. Read the instructions. We're going to sell them at 10 o'clock because we've got enough things to do early on. We don't want to mess around with selling cards. We'll start selling them at 10. We sell them all the way to 12 30. And once all three decks are sold. We never, I don't think we've ever sold all three decks, but we've come close. Uh, then it shuts off for sales. So, um, you have to be present, you have to be present to win. But that's when you have to be, because we have no way of identifying them. All that. So, you have to be present to win. That it says it on there. Number four, <laughs> must be present yeah. to win. Put your face on. <laughs> okay, then we have silent auction rules on the silent auction table. And this one says some items have a starting bid. I promise they're going to be low starting bids because I don't like high starting bids. I think that just kills an auction. And plus, I want to give people a chance. There may be something in there that somebody really wants. And, you know, I want them to think you get a deal, right? You're coming to get a deal. So I hope you do. Uh, some items have a minimum bid increment. Well, the, I think they're all going to have a minimum bid increment. Uh, I saw the silent auction at our Christmas party. I wasn't too happy that some people were bidding 50 cents. <laughs> <laughs> it is at 3 p.m., same time that we start our, our uh, drawing for the uh, raffle. If not present, the winner must have registered at front desk. So that's the importance of having that front desk sign in for everybody. So we'll be able to contact with you. And if not registered, we can't find you, the runner up there. So, uh, and this has happened before. Uh, I was at a CCA banquet two years ago, three years ago, and they called the sign of auction winner's name. He never showed up. And I was number two. So I got me, I got me some, a good because I substantially lower than the guy who did pipes. Okay, raffle rooms. This is for the raffle table, and there'll probably be about three tables, maybe four tables of raffle items because that's what it's going to pass. Donations, we call them donations. There are five tickets for five dollars, 12 tickets for ten dollars. 30, this is, should be 25 tickets. Mm -hmm. I need to fix that. 25 tickets for $20. Okay. 
inflation is going up. So, uh, so you can see the best deal is to spend $20 and get the maximum number of tickets. But if you renew your membership, how many people have not renewed your membership this year? Everybody here has renewed their membership for 2022. Good. Then you all get 12 free raffle tickets. Plus, anybody who renews or signs up. Oh, at the, I thought you had to, well, I thought you had to be there to renew it the best way to get you 12. That's not the way we've done it in the past. In the past, we've done it where if you had renewed your membership for the year, you get 12 free tickets. So if you signed up at the membership, at the raffle, at the fest, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but so you're saying all of us get 12 free tickets. Right. <laughs> so if you're new to membership and everybody else in here, everybody in here has, we get 12 free tickets. Congratulations. So <laughs> who who is going to have the uh, data on who has already thank you and for those who have it Good. this will be an opportunity for, for them to sign renew their membership or if they're new to the club mm -hmm. sign up to get free tickets okay the drawing will be at three o'clock you do not need to be present to win as long as you put your name on the ticket you put your name on the ticket We'll collect it for you if you're not there, and then we'll get in touch with you. And we'll either bring it to a club meeting or we'll, we'll, make, we'll figure some way out to get you the trust and prize. Which drawing is that? This is the raffle. Raffle drawing. The raffle when you go out? Okay. Raffle is at three o'clock. So our auction is at three o'clock. The hand of straw is at 12 30. Okay. Any questions on the fundraising part of this? So if someone asks if you put that that ticket in a, against an item, your name must be on there. Yes. Yeah. But if you have your name on there, I mean, I, I get the, we all get the uh, roster. We can hunt you down. We can get the country. Some people can get a lot of members. It's a member you get, but. Oh, you're right. That's why they sign in, though. When they sign in on a sheet, they're a guest, they, have, they should put their phone. Because it says that on here. It says, if not present, winner must have registered at the front desk to contact it. So the sign-in sheet that I'm going to give you is a sign-in sheet for people coming in. Okay? And they put their name and phone number and address. So the people at the desk need to know when they ask, why do you need my phone number? Or email address. Or email, yeah. That's why. So any questions about anything regarding the festival this, this Saturday? Well, there's no entry fee for the guests and people coming to the festival, right? It's free admission for everybody. Well, Mike? Uh, Cindy, are you going to be able to say what? Why don't you uh, ask for what's the best way to do this as far as getting volunteers? people? Volunteers? Hmm? Are you talking about signing up for volunteers? Yeah. Um, well, we could send them, we could pass the sheet around or they could just sign up on the way out. Okay. So go ahead and put down. Barbara and uh, Pat, 
being there for the opening on the uh, greater ticket sellers. And everybody got something to write with? Chris, what? I have a question on the list that was sent out. I think it came out earlier today or something about um, you already have any down for duct tape or is it? Well, I guess you didn't have an idea how much duct tape is around. Okay. So guess did you send an email out today, this afternoon or something? What's that? Uh, about this Chris bringing duct tape? It was it was a bunch of people. What what they were doing and had me down for donuts and duct tape. I just want to know how much duct tape to bring. Why? Probably about two rolls is all we need. Two three rolls. I like that idea. All right. So is the is it the volunteer sheet sitting on the table, or do we want to pass it around? What's the best way? Hey guys, came here with the bottle. Hey, hey. If they can just sign up on the way out, that way everybody has equal opportunity to sign up. Okay. So don't just uh, hit the door and run out. And if you want to, if at the regular meeting starts, if you want to go back there and quietly sign out, it's good. Um, any, any other questions about this? Uh, one thing that you need to know is that I believe it's, uh, well, first of all, the city of Pineville lets us use Keys Park uh, Center there for free, but that's on the condition that we make a donation to a charity. I can't and what we've been doing is donating to the food bank. And last year, I think we donated a thousand dollars, right, Rich? Right, it's roughly what is it guess roughly half what we made? Uh possibly a little more. Just a little more. Okay, yeah. yeah. So if you um if you're bidding on something, don't consider it a um hey man, I'm gonna get this thing real cheap, but also think about the fact that when you're donating to the club and to a charity. Okay. Um, it doesn't mean do something crazy, but still that's what it is. And it's a um, it's a good time to talk to people about fly fishing, fly casting, point them in a direction if you know somebody there that's a lot smarter than you are, like uh, if somebody wants to know about trout fishing. Everybody know Carlton Townsend right here? Raise your hand, Carlton. Uh, Carlton is uh, where many of us, the first, our first point of contact if something about trout fishing. Other guys too. But um, so just to help be a good host and uh, enjoy yourself. It's going to be a good time. Did we ever find about the ice machine? Oh. Uh, ice machine, anybody find out about that? No, I'm supposed to. I'll check it tomorrow. Okay. Okay, but then if not, then we'll just have to pick it yeah. up. Yeah. Why don't you fire out a, an email to the board? Okay. At that time, we'll know what we got to do. Are you, are you the ice man? No, no ice man. I don't know if they thought they had a machine. They didn't need one. from am Okay, oh, we yeah. didn't find out from the ice man. I got to run there tomorrow morning. So I'll, I'll, I got to run there tomorrow morning. Okay. So All right. Any other questions, guys? Okay, um, we'll start with our regular meeting now. We, we have a, uh, present, another presentation by Kat. You, get, you think, okay, ICAST stands for what? Well, I'll, I'll talk about well, ICAST in a second. Um, um, okay, in the meantime, uh, we've got a financial report. About $6,000 in the treasury. We have 96 members. We've got about 30 who have not renewed. Um, and we're working on that. Uh, we have a bunch of new members here today. And I want them to introduce themselves. There's Kevin. Kevin, stand up and talk a little bit about yourself. Besides the fly fishermen, pretty good at trolling. I live in the neighborhood of the 
bricks and he trolled my house and hooked me. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a retired USDA employee. Uh, there. I absolutely know nothing about fly fishing. So uh, I'm I'm looking forward to uh, going in the group and learning and seeing if I can get my coordination in the place I can actually you know, apply for this. So. Steve, tell us about your guest. Well, I have a guest here tonight trying to lower our, our median age. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Carlton and uh, the name Lewis Thompson. Lewis is just here. I told him to come by and see what we're about. He fly fishes out in Colorado with his brother sometimes. So thought he'd come by and just see. Same learning this. Don't know a whole lot yet, but learning some new info. He just Good. mentioned the street out here. Is oh, that no. No. <laughs> oh, no. You need somebody to carry your bags. <laughs> Who's well, next? Your putting is screwed up. No, <laughs> well, I'm going to introduce your guest. So I've got one guest that didn't come tonight, but y'all want to cross uh, Clint Ward? No plan. Yeah. And by the he wants to come. More people to reach out to him. Um, and then Jeremy Duncan. I, I was at his house right before Christmas, and uh, he asked me about the club. So apparently, word on the street is it's a fly club. <laughs> so it's getting around. That's a good thing. Anyway, I invited Jeremy. And that, so. Yeah. Man. Where are we going? He already wants a cap. So hey. Have you got a uh, done deal? You have experience as a uh, black ass? No, I've been twice in Colorado. Like. Or, uh, okay, well, that's great. Any, any other new guys, Chris? Anthony. Wow. But Keith, I think I just know five. Hey, Robin, we uh, we're both retired, and uh, in my belief, I've been five issues about twenty-five years. And you have? We uh, you know, hey, Robin, I've got her uh, rod last. I think we were talking. Uh, she's a lot better than I am. We've got several members in here for happy I didn't know Rich, Rich he was trolling me too there to said that. So he uh, <laughs> uh, got a text the other morning. I ran into Dane Roddenberry. Uh, uh, How's the Boskies? Yeah, the Boskies. He's my neighbor around the street. Yeah, they with my baby. I'm gonna have to be careful about who I tell I'm not. I'm happy to be here. You're welcome. Any other new guys? Yeah, my name is Monroe Thompson. I uh, live out 28 West here. I'm a new guy in the fly fishing, not a, not a new member of fly fishing. is all new for me. And uh, I guess I've been initiated this past Thursday. I, some people say they were baptized for the third time, but uh, <laughs> I had a great trip this past week. Oh, good. Where'd you go? We went up to uh, Southern Arkansas up there. In the, uh, a little more? Little more. Little more. Oh, yeah. Good. You're, you're in good company. Well, welcome, back, everybody. Okay. Uh, the. the uh, any fish reports? Well, that's what I was, I was trying to remember. I just came to my head. Um, this afternoon, I got a message from Wildlife and Fisheries. They're going to stop rainbow trout in some of the ponds in uh, north and west of Louisiana. Port Bulo over here and Park Natchitoches. How many of y'all been to the new park in Natchitoches? It's a tremendous facility, world class. Um, Baseball sports facility over there. And they've got about a seven acre pond out there. And uh, I'll tell you this I, I fished Fort Bulo last winter for the rainbow trout. I found it difficult to fish out there. It's very little space to fly cast from, and it's kind of muddy out there. Park in Nakish is really nice. That lake out there is really nice. Lots of room to back cast. And everything, and I had great success over there. I caught probably in the course of two months, I probably caught five fish that were. Of course, I caught some small ones too, but those those big fish were really fun. Um, to start this Thursday, uh, they're going to. Uh, we're all this. We're all. Next. Next.
who's going yeah. to Lake mm -hmm. Charles um, and Corolla and uh, Parish Park in Ruston. Yeah, yeah Pearson Lake. So I plan to be at NAC the day after. Out there, if anybody wants to come by, out there, we'd be glad to help them. to catch with fly. Secret is to be patient, slow, and let you move it slowly. Uh, a lot of they throw lures like that, and, and those can just kind of bite anything down. I hope you coach Burley Johnson. Anything <laughs> Nerves. Yeah, because I was out there catching one. <laughs> Our uh, mixed bag reporter, thanks for. Uh, about, I think, 16 somewhere, I can tell you. <laughs> Um, already, we were um, no surprise. Our friend Chris Williams, um, you want to explain what, yeah, uh, you can get slow, yeah, but no. I haven't looked at it or knew our mixed bag competition. Our tournament that we do, the species you can the size the fish is. Matter of fact, you'll see a lot of bluegill that are, you know, this big or whatever it may be. It's and and so uh, it's, you take a picture of it, uh, take a picture of it with your iPhone. There's a link on the web page. Catch has got the page up or a link to the entry form. It goes to a Google form. And you just fill that out and picture two. Here, the contest ends November 30th, midnight. Tally up everyone's number of species that are the top five people with uh, non merchandise awards, uh, actually, not cash, excuse me, awards like merchandise or gift cards or something like that. But beyond those top five, uh, we have a consolation drawing, which this year will have a minimum. And for each fish you submit, you get a ticket to that consolation drawing. So it, it behooves you to submit eight or 10 fish, even if you're not a different species, even if you're not in the uh, in the leads. Oh, we've got more, 26 total. You can. Uh, and it's just, and and look for, for fish you may not have thought about catching on a fly rod. Uh, there are, uh, Jerry Patton last year caught 30 different species on his fly rod. He won the contest. I think Chris Williams from Sorrento, a member from Sorrento, caught 26, I believe was the number he caught. So a lot of variety out there between the salt water, the warm water around here, and the boundaries of the, uh, of the tournament include trout water. All of Texas, all of Oklahoma, all of Arkansas, of course, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida, west of the Appalachian River. Uh, don't ask me why we picked that, so the reasons for the Appalachian Cove. But it's basically the, the, the Gulf Coast region of Fly Fishers International, is what it is, you know, our, our parent organization. So it's just a lot of fun to get out and look for, uh, you know, some new and different species like. Uh, you know, I've never heard of a flyer. Many of you probably have before, but that was a new species for some of us. It's a little small, fairly uncommon uh, panfish out there that, uh, that's pretty cool to fish. fish. And, you know, we've seen, uh, well, up here we've got chain pickerel, of course, rainbow bluegill, we've got red drum. Um, we usually get carp, gar, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's really any level. Lots of lots of interesting fish out there. So, and if you you take a picture of it, because 
identify them. If you don't know what it is, we'll figure out what it is. If you take a good photo, okay? I've got a buddy of mine sitting here trying to throw them back and take pictures right. of them at the same time. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to ID. Nope. Okay. But, so, you know, just take that. You can't send it in if we can identify. The picture of the fish and the fly, uh, just to show that it's uh, and like like this one's got the fly rail in line and fish, even though you can't see the. This is a rainbow trout, uh, even though you can't see the fly. So uh, fly rod, the fly, any of those is fine as long as we can identify the fish. It's a good. Uh, it's a good photo, especially sunfish. Mm -hmm. It's got to be good because they're so close. To identifying one from another, mm -hmm. be a good, real good photo. You doubt yeah, take two of them. Red breast, we've got red spotted, we've got, and there's a bunch of different different species of sunfish. Yeah, so it's, they're, they're, uh, one of the things that people have come up to me and, and asked, not just in this call, but people have seen this because the public can click on this and see what was caught and what flies have been asked, what are all these different flies? Like mm -hmm. big eyes to do so. Guy's choice hands here, redfish river. You know, it, it's, it, it opens up uh, quite a knowledge base right there of different flies that people can use. And so uh, it brings it to our attention, of course, that, you know, we're willing to share where you, you know, what those flies are, where you can find something to tie. You can see a video of the top of the fly or a picture of the fly, so you know what it looks like. On the flat tie. Yeah, we have our YouTube channel. We do. We do. Have, we do have a YouTube channel where these videos, like this meeting, of course, I forgot to start it until quarter after. But anyway, um, we do all of our fly time sessions are recorded there. They're, they're streamed via YouTube live. They're Zoom if you can't make it and you want to interact, so you can log into the Zoom. Uh, like we're Zooming this meeting, we Zoom all the time because we do monthly fly time. Um, and that's also, like I said, streamed on YouTube, and so it's recorded. And so even if you if you're not synchronous with the meeting, you can always go back to the YouTube. What well, we did, Parachute Adams, in uh, uh, January or earlier this month, and I think we already have like 33, 35 views. So club members are going back to take a look at it. If you just go to YouTube and search for Passage Yeah, and then Mike caught one on this recently, that Mike Valentine called Bluegill on. And our next fly, since I, since I have a, a captive audience, our fly for February, Jim Johnson is going to lead us, aren't you, Jim? Yeah. In tying a brim killer. It's an old pattern. Yeah, it's going to be a brim killer. Yeah. Brim killer. It's basically like a slow sinking spider with a squirrel hair back on it. It's, both, it's, a, and it's a those slow sinking spider type flies are really good. So we'll do that one. And that's on Thursday. It is on Thursday, and you think you're rich. You do not have to have your own equipment, all materials. If you don't have equipment, we'll supply equipment for you. We supply materials for everybody. So it's free plug members. So if you do have equipment, bring it with you. Uh, if not, we have probably half dozen sets of material that we can we can loan you. And uh, this will be this is a really the fly we tied in the parachute atoms we tied in January is kind of a like a, on a one to ten, it's about an eight fly. This one's about a three or a two or three. So uh, this one's, uh, you know, kind of try to mix it yeah, up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Why'd you say that that was your first one to the uh, level? Uh, the first it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, that's the new one, the tougher ones, ones you have a tie. It is. Trust me. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, just uh, primarily for the new guys. Normally, the second Monday of the month, we tie a fly. Um, and then the fourth Monday of the month, we have a, a membership meeting. February, somebody scheduled a membership meeting on the second Monday, which is the 14th of February. Well. That was flight time. Yeah. Flight and I yeah, found out things like. Don't blame like, the membership guys. Huh? Don't that's blame flight the membership time. Guys. That's right. Sorry. Yeah. 
And that got moved to Thursday because um, oh, there's a lot of complaints about it. I don't know who in the hell, excuse my language, scheduled it on second Monday. I know who did it. Uh, enormous me, but it wasn't me this time. But one of the things I found out is that one of our members, his wife's birthday is on Valentine's Day. Man, is that is that is a convenience I wish I had. <laughs> I've seen more fights in families on Valentine's Day. No, it, Mother's Day, it, anyway. It, it's not so, a convenience. It's so not. We <laughs> that British, That's him. And, uh, you know, naturally, I would take my wife out on her birthday, on Valentine's Day, and we'd sit there at the table, which was overpacked, but we had to wait 25 minutes to get a seat. And the service was terrible and the food was terrible. So after that, we went the night after Valentine's Day out. And we had the whole place ourselves. And we had like five waiters waiting on us. And it was great. So. Okay. Um, are, any quick questions, for, especially from the new guys? If not, um, that's, uh, this, this briefing has been very, very informative uh, in the past years. And Catch is the guy to do it because he understands everything he's talking about. <laughs> Catch, you got, I got my finger on the pulse of the industry. <laughs> so I, uh, I've been going to ICAST starting about 10 years ago. And then eight years ago, Fly Tackle View emerged with ICAST and they became one show. And then uh, they split again three years ago because the guys in fly tackle dealer mostly fly people from guides dealers pro staff whatever from up north couldn't stand july in orlando florida no blame them it's hot but uh, they started going having a separate show again but they've been canceled the last two years because of COVID. They're scheduled to take place this year in march uh, normally they're in September, uh, October. So uh, I went to ICAST this year. And uh, just to tell you what ICAST is, it's the world's largest fishing trade show. It's conducted by the convention. It's the uh, American Sport Fishery Association. Uh, it takes place in Orange County um, Convention Center down in Orlando, Florida. It's got an enormous, it's an enormous show. Uh, IFTD is the Fly Tackle Dealer Show, and uh, that's put on by the American Fly Fishing Trade Association. And like I said, for four years, they were merged together. Previously, Fly Tackle Dealer was separate from ICAST, and now they're separated again. And then there's also a retailer. Um, there's two of those. One of them, the winter show, is next weekend. That's why Pack and Paddle will be at our show. Um, and then there's another one in September. The winter show is for summer clothing and stuff, tents and everything else, backpack and everything else. And uh, the summer show, which is in September, is the one where they give us to show off skiing and other winter stuff, coats and everything else. If you think about it, vendors or retailers who go to these shows or looking at stuff and start putting into their inventory, you know, three, four months down the line. That's why it's kind of reversed there. Now, ICAST is more than just a product show. There are seminars and workshops on various tracks, everything from uh, fishing tactics and things like that to uh, workshops for retailers. Um, there's also, uh, like in this case, uh, there were several conservation tracks. Uh, people who were involved in conservation, there's probably about 30 or 40 conservation groups that are there at ICAST. And they have meetings and they bring in industry professionals across the board. Uh, this one was on uh, <coughs> Menhaden, the issue with Menhaden harvesting in the Gulf of Mexico. And they probably had 150 people here for a luncheon that were in there. Um, celebrities abound, and not just fishermen like Bill Dance, Roland Martin, 
uh, Skeet Reese, whoever. You also have NBA players, uh, Major League Baseball players, NASCAR. I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, who's a comedian that was up there a couple of years? No, it's an actor. Uh, Waterboy, he played in Waterboy, Coach Klein, the Fonz. Oh, Henry Winker. Henry Winker. Winker. He's written books on fly fishing, by the way. Yeah, he was there. I didn't have, I, I, I thought I had his picture, but I didn't have it for this presentation. Um, the event format is on a Tuesday, they have an on the water demo and a bass tournament. Tuesday night, they have a new product reception showcase where, you know, they have tables all around the room like that. Of course, you know, people are drinking cocktails and everything else, but they're showing off the new products as well. And then Wednesday is when things really get started. They have a keynote breakfast and stay of the sport, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then, of course, Wednesday, Wednesday through Friday is the expo. There's 650,000 square feet. There's over a thousand brands represented in there. Um, this past year, there were 11,000 attendees. That includes exhibitors, retailers, buyers, media guides. So it was actually down about 2,000 for the previous year. And for me, this is an event to remember or forget. This was me before ICAST, and that was me after ICAST. <laughs> ICAST turned out to be a super spreader event for the Delta variant of COVID. And many of my fishing colleagues that I know and friends I have that were at the show uh, came down with COVID. And uh, some were sick for a couple of days, some were sick for a week. The only one that was hospitalized was me. Four and a half weeks I was in the hospital mm -hmm. with COVID pneumonia. And I got off the ox, I started to get off the oxygen at the end of September when I got an infection, you think it was mono, and I was in the hospital again for another three weeks. And didn't get off oxygen to the end of November. Uh, just went to the pulmonologist the other day. My lungs are back up to about 85%. So I'm not quite all the way there, but considering that two weeks before I cast, I hiked seven miles at 10,000 feet altitude in Colorado. And now, you know, if I get a mile, I'm doing good. <laughs> so. It was, it was a rough year and COVID really hit um, ICAST pretty bad. This is probably why. <laughs> so all in line get free beer. <laughs> so at four o'clock each day, uh, a lot of the exhibitors start having free beer. But this line was the longest of all. And the reason is they probably had 200 people in line right here. I, I wish I had a picture of all the people behind me. And the reason was because they gave you a beer ticket and you put your name on it and you got to where you get your beer and you put the ticket in the bucket. And on the final day, they were giving away a flats boat. A what? Yeah, a flats no. boat, $22,000 boat, motor trailer outfit. So I went through here about four <laughs> times each day. <laughs> And I'm not a beer drinker. So I take my beer. I went over to where Tarquito had their little demonstration with the water and the little electric engines and poured the beer in there. And I'm probably thinking that by the end of the day, they thought somebody had peed in there. Dang. <laughs> <laughs> but I went through that line four oh, times each day. Oh. It didn't help. I didn't win. So why go to ICAST if your interest is fly tackle? Because, you know, that's what I've been writing on for 20 years in Louisiana Sportsman. It's about fly fishing, fly tackle. I do a column each year, or I did a column each year until last year, um, on new stuff, new products. It's the most popular column I do every year for Louisiana Sportsman because people really are interested in some of the new products you see out there. Well, it turns out that 
there's a world of products out there that people buy, regardless of whether you fly fishing or conventional fishing. A net, waders, you know, I mentioned kayaks, trolling boats, scales, go through a whole list of things, jackets, buffs, hats, whatever. It's just, a, you, you wouldn't think about it, but you go there, you start walking the aisles and you realize how much stuff that is here that is interest to fly fishing primarily, that interests anybody who fishes. So there's also a large number of manufacturers who make conventional rods, who make fly rods. TFO was there. They had their fly rods there. TFO also makes casting and spinning rods. Berkeley and Hardy are part of Pure Fishing. And so Pure Fishing was there with all their products, like Berkeley and so on. And there was Hardy with their fly rods, and there was Ben with their fly rods. And uh, I could go on and on. There's only a few companies out there that are strictly fly fishing. They weren't there. Sage is one, Scott, Winston, but I think that's all pretty much. Everybody else is playing the game where they're making fly rods as well as conventional tackle, and they were there. So uh, here's my products that I give stock up. Okay. I think they're, they're, I was on Shark Tank, I give them the money. <laughs> okay. Uh, this one it was the Habit Fishing Skur River Shirt. And what's, what's cool about it is these high quality new plaid shirts that sell for like six to hundred dollars. And this one's only $39. So price point wise, this is a real good quality shirt at a good price. Flying Fisherman Sun Bandit Breathable. Flying Fisherman makes uh, some of the best, <coughs> we call them gators, uh, neck gators, whatever things you put. You know, they were popular for us before COVID came along. And after COVID, you see a lot of people wearing them now that, uh, for masks, but uh, they help protect your face and everything else. Um, Flying Fisherman has cooperated with uh, or worked with several artists in the fly fishing business to make some really nice designs for their uh, gators. This was a, a BSG doing something great. It's a female owned company. And they decided that women needed female sized specific clothing. Uh, one of the problems in the fishing industry is you have a lot of unisex uh, clothing, which doesn't really fit well on women. It's designed by men, made for a man, man's body. It just happens that, you know, sometimes they fit snugly or whatever on a woman's breast. <laughs> you know, your women know what I'm talking about. Uh, this young lady and her uh, partner came up with all these different uh, this, this woman's line of clothing. And I think this is great. If you go to the kayak shop here in town, they sell, and they'll be at the, the festival, they sell uh, vibe kayaks in boat. Now, boat is an inflatable um, stand up paddleboard, but they've expanded now to make inflatable kayaks. And this one right here, was new at iCast, and it's got a pedal drive in it. And they've got one right now at the kayak shop. Uh, if you go there, you can see it in person. What's great about this thing is this whole this boat right here is really, really stable. And it's tougher, a lot tougher than you think it is for an inflatable. It can, it can hold up to a lot of bangs. And the best part is you can put it into a bag about this big take it with you somewhere, possibly even on an airplane. Take a kayak on a plane and go somewhere. It's, it's got cool. a pedal drive on it? It's got a pedal drive on it. 
So it must have some rigid component. Yeah, the drive is. And part of that is for two, but it still fits in the bag. It's shown in the bag, so. Now this one is uh, from Navy Watercraft. It's a Falcon 11. And it was their answer to the Jackson Bite and the Crescent Kayak CK1, which is 11 foot kayak. Right now, uh, for some reason, 11 foot kayaks are the hottest thing. Lightweight 11 foot kayaks. For a while, a lot of the kayaks, fishing kayaks that were being sold were 14, 15 feet long and weighed over hundred pounds. Like 110, 120 pounds. I'm thinking, <laughs> where, where, you know, what's wrong with this picture right here? You know, part of the deal with a kayak is being able to move it around and lightweight and you know, be able to combat launch in some spots. I mean, you couldn't really combat launch a 120 pound kayak. Pretty much had to bring it into the water on a trailer. Uh, so. Um, <clears throat> Industry apparently adjusted because they do that. And they came up with these lightweight kayaks that weigh under 70 pounds. And maybe this right here with them. And the best part is this is an American made kayak that sells for under $800. Comes with a high low seat adjustment. It only weighs 60 pounds. And uh, it's pretty fast. It, it does, it uh, paddles pretty fast. It's got, uh, 34 inches wide, so you can stand up in it too. This one is uh, Yugo waterproof pouches. There's quite a few waterproof pouches on the market, but these are specific sized to whatever you have. If you have an iPhone, you have a Samsung Galaxy, if you have a laptop, and I'm thinking, okay, who brings a laptop? <laughs> with them in a boat or canoe or whatever, and need some waterproof, but they've got that. They've got a tablet version, for example, that sells for 149. Actually work it through this, uh, plastic. So I can't imagine. Did I do that? Um, this is TFO's Mangrove Coast. TFO has a line of rods, for saltwater fishing called the mangrove. It's a really good rod, but it wasn't quite as fast as the other rods that sold for about $300. Rod, it doesn't have that speed you need sometimes to combat the wind. So they answer mangrove coast, which uh, mangrove has a, the TFO mangrove coast has a Faster. They meant that. Uh, they made it. What's the deal with the grip there on the? Uh, oh, uh, looking at grip. We think now when they're taking the cord and putting rings on it like that, kind of a design thing. To kind of, they put it on their premium rods, or e even midpoint uh, mid price rods like these. Uh, this is odd shape, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it just adds a flair. <laughs> TFO also introduced uh, NTR Reel. It's fully machined and sealed for $139 to $169. So this is a reel if you want to buy a, it's hard to find a reel under $200 that you can take into the salt, especially into the surf. This one you can, it's fully sealed drag. Fully machined. So they'll uh, handle the salt and the surf. Pretty good. I tested it out and the drag is really good. I'd probably say it's about 10 pounds maximum on there, which is much more than you need. As Pete Cooper used to say, he never put a drag on his more than six pounds. And uh, he caught tuna. Um, of a mid-price rod that they created a salt version of for salt water use. 
and this is St. Croix Imperial Salt. It's made here in the United States. Uh, like with the TFO mangrove, the St. Croix Imperial saltwater weights like seven, eight, nine. With good rods, but they just didn't have enough fast action for some saltwater anglers. So they created this one right here. And I'm telling you, I had no problem putting 100 feet of line on, on this rod right here. It really is a good rod. It's made in the United States. So, uh, like the mangrove coast, it's got a lifetime warning. So if you break it for any reason, you send the complete rod back to St. Croix and they send you a new one. There's a charge for replacement is <clears throat> compared to the price of a rod, it's small. This one um, is one of the premium rods, Loomis NRX ST. And uh, it was designed for bass fishing and pike fishing, musky fishing. It's slightly shorter. Uh, I couldn't believe how light this rod was for a rod that is supposed to be used to catch big fish and land big fish. And it's surprising because that, that butt section down there looks a little big and you think, okay, it's heavy. But with these new nano, nanocarbon um, uh, epoxies, these nano epoxies that they use into build, building these rods, it's just amazing how light these rods have gotten. This one weighs 3.2 ounces, which it used to be a saltwater fly rod weighed like four and a half to five ounces. When I first started, you know, saltwater fishing in the late 80s, 90s. So they've got almost half the weight that they had back then. Now, this is a conventional rod company in South Florida called Bull Bay Tackle. And they were just making casting spinning rods. But the son of the owner, this young man right here, Tyler, uh, he really has become a, a gung ho fly fisherman. So he convinced his dad to start building fly rods. And so they're making these TAC X rods right here. And uh, I have right there $700. It's probably going to be close to $600. But you can see they have the wind grip on there, that black grip right there is a carbon grip that helps um, your hands, you know, if you're fishing all day, you know, with cork, you know, especially fishing salt water, you can, your hands can get a little irritated or whatever, and you can lose your grip or whatever, not, and these really help. Uh, and they also stay clean because you can just scrub them off or whatever with a towel. And clean them at the end of the day a lot better than you can in court. Uh, I, I, I tested all the rods that I put up here. And uh, these right here felt so light in the hand and really were as good as any rod out there on the market today. So I think this, this young man's going to have a good, good business with that rod. And then there was a company there called Paramount. I'd never heard of them before. I'd never seen them before. Um, they make waders and boots. Well, it turns out that the father, again, it's another father-son deal right here. The father was the uh, designer for Hodgman. Remember Hodgman's? Mm -hmm. I think we all had Hodgman's when they had kind of gone away. Well, the father started Paramount uh, Company and uh, his son's working with him. And these waders and boots are made in South Korea and they sell for quite a bit less than the Sims and the Patagonia, but they're really good quality stuff. And uh, for example, all their waders have padding around the knees, reinforcement uh, to help, you know. And, uh, they make waiting boots that have cleats, Screw on cleats, felt, the whole uh, nine yards. They also have uh, waist high waders, wading pants, I should say, 
really nice. So start, you'll start seeing them because they just started up last year, was, uh, last January. So you should start seeing these in fly shops soon. Now, products that got stocked down, too, because <laughs> I don't think these things make any sense to me or just don't. This is a thing called the Ike Jiny Kit. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it right. But what it is, is when you catch a fish, you take this needle about this long and you stick it up the spine of the fish and then you click a button or something on there and it short circuits the nervous system. It causes the fish to do this and it kills them or something. But apparently, this guy was explaining that when you catch a fish and you put it on ice and it's still alive for a while, it secretes enzymes that damage the fish's flesh. I've never noticed it. Has anybody ever noticed that? <laughs> that fish tastes terrible? <laughs> well, that's what he was saying. You know, that fish taste much worse than they would if, you know, if we, we, we stop that nervous system or whatever from secreting these enzymes. So he's got this thing right here. And then he passed out samples of fish that were done without it, cooked without the Ike Jimey thing and others that were caught and <laughs> this thing was used and then got a taste test. <laughs> Nobody could. It's like it's COVID. <laughs> it must have been. I must have had COVID. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> this whole thing just kind of freaked me out. I don't think it's going to be a seller. Um, this is the Yak Power Party Bar. So now you can take your kayak out and you have 20 watts of stereo sound. Uh, you can have flashing lights on here so you can take your party on the water. Okay. Remember, this is a fishing convention. All right. Got a link for this. Oh, <laughs> is that hot? <laughs> <Okay. laughs> you put my leg right there. <laughs> yeah, so I don't, I don't think this is the right place to market this. A lot of strange looks when people came by and saw that demo. Um, this is the Mike Iconelli edition of the Holy Pro Angler 14. Um, it's got special things on it and everything else. It's got Ike's design. And for those who don't know, Ike is one of the biggest names of bass fishing. <clears throat> and he's taken to kayak fishing a whole lot. In fact, he competes in several kayak fishing events across the country each year now. Um, the problem is with all the accessories and everything, I hope he probably number 14 is already heavy. It's about 130 pounds. Now it's 158 pounds, this edition. And uh, it sells for $5,300 as a starting price. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think I saw one at Bass Pro, you know, $7,000 boat. You know, <laughs> I don't know. I think I'd take the boat. <laughs> I got to trailer this around and pay that much money. I'd go with the boat. But hey, it's Mike's, it's Ike's name. It's Ike on it. Okay, so that was my winners and losers from ICAST. There, I, there were a lot of items I saw, I just didn't want to have to report on them all. But I think those are the big ones. Um, as I told you on Wednesday, is the keynote address, five on the state of the sport. The state of the sport is given by the Recreational Boat Fishing Foundation, RBFF. It's put together probably about two weeks before the before ICAST each year and reflects all of the surveys that they did through the previous year. So in the spring of each year, they start to survey all the wildlife agencies. They survey retailers, they survey anglers, they do all their surveys in the spring, and then they culminate that with putting the report together in the early part of summer. And then by July 1st, they have their report and the uh, 
president or whoever with RBFF at the um, ICAST gives a report. Remember, it's the stats from the previous year. So July would be, the stats would be from 2020. So in 2020, we had nearly 55 million participants in fishing. That was the highest overall in 14 years. And I, I think you might understand why we had COVID outbreak. A lot of people couldn't get together. So as we do, we took the outdoors. It wasn't just fishing. According to the, uh, similar surveys I've seen, hiking, biking, all kinds of outdoor activities took a big jump in 2020. Um, Hispanics represent the largest increase um, and an all-time high for fishing. Uh, we also had an all-time high for the number of female fishermen in the country in 2020. And youth participation rose 53%. So it was a great year for the fishing industry and fishing in general. As far as fly fishing goes, we saw one of the largest increases in number of fly fishing participants in 2020. We went, we've been on an increase, steady increase since 2010. Um, but last year, I should say year before 2020, we went from 7 million to 7.8 million participants, or roughly 11% of the population in the United States now fly fishing. or I should say 11% of all fishermen are fly fishing. Here's the demographics for fly fishing. It's always been mostly college, as you can see right there from education. It's about the same. Uh, income is about the same. What has changed though in the last two, three years, especially the last year, was age, and the ethnicity, ethnicity, ethnicity. I got it right, okay? Ethnicity. Um, we're still mostly white folks that fly fish, but Hispanic has gone up 2% from the previous year. And I can tell you, I know a lot of people, <coughs> Hispanic people, because my, you know, my two daughter-in-laws are both you know, Hispanic and their families and friends are taking it up. We're going to see that jump probably to 15% in the next year or two. Um, age was a big change. That 25 to 34 demographic right there, it was up a whopping 18%. It was probably in the low teens, like 12, 13, the year before. And so it took a big jump, and that's good. And 18 to 24 is up, 13 to 17 is up. So it used to be kind of an old man's sport. <laughs> and now we have more women, we have more Hispanics, but more, most important, we have a lot more young people take get fly fishing. And regionality, there's been some changes over the last 10 years as well. South Atlantic is now the number one area has the most participants in the whole country. Um, as you can see where we live, West, South, Central, has 10% uh, of all the fly fishermen in the United States. Uh, Middle Atlantic, which is for years was way at the top, has 17%. It's come down some. New England has come down quite a bit. It's only 3% now. And Pacific, has kind of stayed the same at 17%. As you can see, there's been a shift. Well, probably because you haven't seen the previous maps, but there has been a shift more to the south and the east in the last 10 years, as far as fly fishing goes. Okay, so one of the things that bothers me is I have a friend who tells people, that fly fishing 
it's going downhill. And he says it's because the fly shops are all closing. They get beaten on by the internet. Well, not really. <laughs> What's happened is after, remember the movie back in 1994, I wrote a rinse of it? Well, you had every fine brother open up a fly shop. And yet all these fly shops that were out there and by people who really didn't know how to run fly fishing business or a business, I should say. They just happened to be casual fly fishermen who thought, okay, the sport's taking off. Let me get into it. But they really didn't know how to run a business. And so we probably had a surplus of fly fishing shops across the country. And you combine that with people who are retiring and get out of the business and they all have someone to take the business over. And so, yeah, we've had the client at fly shops, but what's taking their place is that general section right there on the, you can see it right there. And that's places like Pack and Paddle, Washtenaw Outfitters, Mariner Sales, Ship to Shore, all these places, you know, Jerry Lee's, they're selling fly fishing stuff that sell other things like kayaks and hiking other stuff. And they're kind of filling that void that the fly shops had. So the big box and the internet, which is really that other right there, that other is eBay and <clears throat> Etsy and Amazon. Um, yeah, they kind of made an impact, but they haven't really uh, taken the things over. In fact, just the opposite, they kind of stalled. Because of price protection. If you want to buy a Rainton rod and you go to eBay, you're going to pay the same amount that you would for that Rainton rod if you went to Pack and Power in Lafayette or you went to Mariner Sales in Dallas or Washington Outfitters in Hot Springs. Same price. So are you going to buy it from Amazon? Or are you going to buy it from John Williams? We'll go out there and give you a casting lesson for free. Yeah, well, well we've got. So that internet business kind of boomed up a little bit and shrunk back down again. The big box right there is Bass Pro, Cabela's, Orvis, LL Bean, Sportsman's Warehouse, so on. Problem there is, except for Orvis, has anybody been Bass Pro Cabela's lately? Mm -hmm. What are they selling? Fly fishing wise. Some clothes. Some clothes, yeah. But as far as fly rods and tackle and things like that. Not much. Exactly. They're selling their house brands. They used to sell other, but they don't want any more. It's all White River or Cabela's rods. White River reels and fellow reels. I went to the Bass Pro in Shreveport. I needed a pair of waders. And the gentleman who was working in there did not know what wading pants were or boot foot waders. Uh, stocking foot waders, I mean, stocking foot waders. He did not know what those are. And so I had to explain it to him. <laughs> So that's what's happening with the big box stores. It's not like they were when they first started off. And since Cabela's is owned by Bass Pro, you're getting the same service at Cabela's that you get at Bass Pro. So the big box stores have not really done so well uh, as far as sales. But again, that, the general um, stores are the ones that are taking off. I think they're going to continue to grow. Uh, so that's the end of the show. <laughs> Somebody posted on the internet that this was the best of show at ICAST. <laughs> the Nike fish shoes. Um, boy, I looked for these all over. And finally, I got an email back from Nike saying, we don't make these. That was a prank. <laughs> and sure enough, I looked at it online. And they didn't get this way. But there are fish shoes in case anybody's interested. <laughs> Just that Nike doesn't make them. I think they should, though. I think they should. They look cool. I'll buy them in a heartbeat.
Any questions on products of any kind, uh, on state of the sport, anything regarding fly fishing or fishing in general? No questions? Okay. All right. Okay, that about wraps it up. A um, couple of announcements, especially for the, uh, the guys, you know, in the meetings, these really are. On the 29th, the uh, rim filler fly, that's not that machine to stick in. Just uh, just talking about that. Um, and then um, the, um, the membership meeting in February, the one on the fourth Monday, is going to be a uh, Fishing, fly fishing oriented, not tying session held by um, Chris Parkins and uh, Robert Hughes. So, um, and we're not going to discuss that now, but it's one of those things that you uh, you live on knots. And if you like me, you can tie fishing knots. But then when I get into the little bitty, Six pound, four pound test, tip it. It's a lot smaller. It's harder for me to see now. I've got a crooked finger here from smart fries like my daddy had. And so uh, those little knots with that light, light line are a challenge. The only way to, to get over it is to do is practice. And I've seen Bill Morrison pass some nuts real quick, so you might want to talk to him. Manage the break. He gets get some fit, huh? Manage the break. <laughs> if they break, that's okay. If they come loose, that's not good. Okay, so that's that's uh that's a wrap. It's adjourned. Welcome guys, welcome all the new guys here. Hello, guys. See you, Steven. Good, good.